Okay, so good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on insider tips to consider when building and managing multilingual websites. My name is Rashid Azam from Vardot, and I will be your host for today. Our speaker is Mohammed Razim, Chief Executive Officer here at Vardot. Just a couple of housekeeping items to go over before we start. Please make sure to utilize the Q&A function. We'll answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Also, I would like to add that this webinar would of course be recorded and the recording will be made available to everyone next week at Vardhad's website. It will also be sent to your email within the next few days. I would like to start with a quick overview of what you do here at uh, Vardot. Basically, since our inception almost 10 years ago, we've been helping influential organizations achieve their digital strategies by providing enterprise level digital experience solutions built on the Drupal CMS. This focus gave us leverage to rank among the top Drupal agencies worldwide. Being Drupal experts, we also give back to the open source community. Our Drupal contributions have been downloaded more than a quarter million times. We are a global company with offices in three continents. Our team is among the largest Drupal certified teams in one company. We also make sure our clients are satisfied by meeting or even exceeding their expectations. And we have accumulated a global know-how by delivering around 200 projects uh, globally. Throughout our experience working with enterprise clients, we've developed a deep understanding of the enterprise requirements. As a result, we adopt cutting edge processes and have international credentials to cater to sophisticated needs. This is a sample of our clients. They are from different verticals and sectors worldwide. I will now turn it over to our speaker, Mohammed Razim, to talk about how we help uh, global organizations communicate with international audience groups through multilingual uh, web experiences. All right. Thank you, Rashid. Um, my name is Mohammed Razem, um, uh, CEO of Vardot, and I'd like to walk you through uh, some tips and uh, cool features when considering building new multilingual websites or even managing existing multilingual websites. So I would like to start um, with, with making sense of multilingual websites. Uh, let's begin with the benefits of having a multilingual website. Why would you invest in a multilingual website? Naturally, um, it's to improve communication. Uh, this is uh, something that allows you to localize your website's content to a global audience. There are 75% of non-English speaking online shoppers and visitors browsing websites and uh, for information. So there's a huge market for you to um, reach. And this is um, evidently reaching a wider audience is uh, another benefit that there's a huge audience speaking multiple languages available for you that you can uh, tap into with a multilingual website. Um, obviously, this would also give you search engine optimization and improve your ranking because now search engines would rank your website higher. They would deliver relevant content for your audience. Um, so if somebody is searching for specific keywords from a particular country, then search engines would give you, uh, would give those people the content that is relevant to them if they were available and translated in your website. Lastly, um, this would definitely achieve the goals and convergence that you would set. So ultimately having a better search engine optimization, reaching wider audience and improving communication would lead into achieving your goals, getting um, higher conversion, whether your goals are sales, whether your goals are um, uh, delivering the impact that your organization or your institution does. This is something that um, and is the ultimate goal that uh, you'd need to achieve from a website. So um, now that we're aware of the benefits, um, I would like to discuss the different multilingual approaches when building a multilingual website. Basically, um, there are different 
approaches when we build a website. And maybe first we need to agree on certain terminology when we think about a multilingual website. And those terminology that I'd like to establish throughout this presentation, this webinar is the interface or template versus the content. So when we look at a typical website, we are, um, this is a homepage of, of a simple website. We're looking at different components that make up the page. Those components um, like the logo and the menu, the menu items itself could be part of the interface or template. While the content, whether news or promotions that could be available on your homepage, these are considered content. Another example, for instance, if you have a listing page that lists news with certain search filters and forms, the forms would be part of your interface and template, while the content that is listed on the website page, such as the news page, would be part of the content. Further examples like the news article itself or a blog post, the, the, the content of the blog, the blog post, the title and the image and the description is all part of the content, while the different, uh, the header and footer could be part of the uh, interface template. When you look at a login page, for instance, mostly it's going to be the interface and template and there, there won't be specific content that is you know, dense in, in, in its elements like text or images or titles that needs to be considered part of the content. So with this in mind, I wanted to establish the, um, those two important terminologies because through those um, components that make up a web page, we would look into different multilingual approaches. So the first approach, which is one of the most common one, is the fully translated website into multiple languages. Think of a website as mysite.com, and this website is available on three languages, English, Spanish, and Arabic. So um, the, the, that website would be, um, the interface would be translated into those three languages. And what's important to mention here is that throughout this webinar and throughout these best practices, we're not talking about silos websites or a website for each language. This is something that I want to clarify from the beginning is that we're looking at a site that manages multiple languages, is translated, the interface is translated and its content can be translated all from one CMS, one backend. You don't need to have separate site or separate system for each language. And this is why I made sure that mysite.com is just one box that encapsulates all the, uh, the different available content uh, and interface options in this website. So with the interface and template would be fully translated and the content itself, the pages that make up the website would also be translated. The home page would be available in English, Spanish, and Arabic. The news page would be also available in those languages. And if you have a product or a news item or anything that could make up your website's content could also be translated. The, this approach is very famous. I want to give you an example of such an approach, which is the UNICEF.org. UNICEF.org is a website built on Drupal. And as Rashid mentioned at the beginning of, of this webinar, we are a Drupal company and we manage and build Drupal websites. Uh, UNICEF is a very good example of a Drupal website that is implements multilingual approaches. So when we open uh, UNICEF.org, you'd find that this website is available with five languages, English, French, Spanish, Arabic, and Chinese. Switching between those languages through the language switcher, the whole content of the page, even the logo is actually changing when you're switching between English, French, and Spanish. The second approach is a fully translated website with its interface and template yet the content could be partially available or even sometimes in a single language. So if we look at the same diagram that we had, the mysite.com is also available in three languages, English, Spanish, and Arabic. The interface would be fully translated and available for all these languages. The content, however, could be partially available in those three languages. So if we look at the homepage, the homepage could be translated to the three languages while certain content such as a news piece or a product 
could be only available in a single language or not translated. So it could show up or not show up on all those uh, available languages in the interface. The example that I want to show you for such an approach is also the UNICEF.org. So UNICEF, while they do have five languages, you can switch the interface to switch between those five languages, a piece of content such as the Yemen crisis that we're looking at right now, it's a, piece, it's a page that talks about the Yemen crisis. You'll find that it's only available in English and Arabic. It's not available on the five languages available there. So the separation of interface and content is something that is common. It could be, um, it could exist in websites. And uh, this is an approach that is legitimate. It really depends on the, the type of business that you have. The third option or approach that I want to also highlight is the regional variations of content. A lot of websites target specific regions and they might not have fully translated content. The nice thing about a CMS like Drupal is that this is also being managed through multilingual interfaces and multilingual options. So if we look at the example here, we're looking at mysite.com, which has three languages. However, they're not really languages, they're just regional variations of the English language. So you'd look at English, English US, and English GB. So that's EN, um, English is targeted to the international audience in general, while uh, EN-US is targeted for the US audience, and EN-GB is targeted for the Great Britain audience. So with that, you'd find that all the content is we refer to it more of a localized content rather than translated content because it's still in English. However, the interface could be, could have variations for each of those options or um, variations. And the pages themselves, the home page could be also localized. The content could be localized and the products themselves could be localized. A famous example of that is mostly commercial companies or global institutions that target a global audience. So if we look at ibm.com as an example, which is also a Drupal-based website, you'd see that IBM targets their international audience through region or geographical areas, which is based on the regional variations of content. The last option, which is, again, it's IBM as an example, is it's a hybrid of a fully translated and regional variations, which is what most common um, enterprises implement because they would they would target certain content. Um, if you um, looking at this, um, for instance, Australia, English, and uh, Argentina, Spanish, but there's also Bahamas in English. So the language itself is geographically um, targeted through regional variations, and also the languages themselves or the pages are also available in multilingual pages and multilingual interfaces. So this is a hybrid option between number one and three. With that in mind, with, with, the, with the understanding that the interface and content could be fully decoupled or separate from each other, I want to highlight that the interface is something that is typically not edited frequently. So once it's translated, once it's created, the edits happen infrequently because the, the, the nature of the content or the nature of the language in the interface is something that is done at the beginning of the project. It also does not require translators expertise because it's usually simple strings like homepage, for instance, or first name and last name, all these labels available on your website, they could be translated and they can um, typically, a lot of CMS have those translations already available where you can just use them. While the content is something that you need to consider more um, seriously, because if you wanna build a multilingual website or manage a multilingual website, every time you create a new piece of content, it needs to be translated and available on the different languages available on your site. So content requires continuous translation. Every time you create content, you need to make sure that it is also available for your audiences to the different um, languages that you have on your site. It also requires effort. It requires expertise and dedication. It requires 
writers to make sure that um, they are uh, professional translators so that they make sure that they um, ensure and implement your writing style. If you have a tone of language that you want to implement on the different languages, um, this is something that you need to consider. So interface and content creation, we see a lot of websites being built and a lot of customers who come to us and mention that they want to build a multilingual website, which is great. So as, as we mentioned, the goals at the beginning, they're really important and they can help your business. But one of the most important things to consider is content requires dedication. It requires continuous translation. Luckily, there are tools to make the content creation easy and streamlined and make the life of website editors easy when they manage different translators who translate the content. So this is why um, or where I want to lead into the next section, which is how we can simplify the translations management, specifically the content via a robust workflow. We're going to take an example. So Jane is our website editor. Jane uh, enters the content in the website, in the CMS, mainly in one language, which is English. All the content comes to her in English and she enters them. Once she enters them, the website is also available in three languages. For this example, we're going to use English, Spanish, and Arabic. So obviously Jane is not a translator herself, right? So she needs to get those different content translations for Spanish and Arabic from different sources, and she needs to enter them on the website. Jane wants to easily collaborate with translators to translate content. She wants to publish to the site and maintain the site's competitive edge of being available in multiple languages. So with that, we want to imagine this simple workflow that Jane would enter the content in English, and she adds the piece of content, news or a blog post to the CMS then she would request a translation job. And once she requests the translation job, before she actually sends it to the translator, she reviews the translation job. Is it fully complete? Um, and the, the number of words available in this piece of content as an example. And then she would choose the translation provider. We have different translation providers. And this is a really cool feature available in Drupal. I want to highlight, um, I will show you, of course, a real-time demo in a bit, but this is a demo that is implementing Drupal 9. And Drupal 9 is in continuous um, innovation. And every six months, there are new versions being released with Drupal 9. And the nice thing about this translation management feature that is available through some modules with Drupal 9 is that it supports different translation providers. So an example, she can send the translation or the content, the English language content to be translated through a machine translation tool that uses artificial intelligence and natural language processing to do the translations. An example of that would be Google Translate or Microsoft Translator API or DeepL, that is a, a famous tool in, in Europe. The other option that could also be available for Jane is if she's dealing or if her institution or company is dealing with a translation service provider. Such service providers use real translators who actually receive the content, they review them, and uh, they're usually paid services such as Jingo and um, Aclaro, uh, as well as Global Link. These tools Jane's company would be already subscribed to, and she just sends the translation job to them. Once it's translated, she would receive back the translation to publish on the website. Another example is a file exchange. This is a really robust and simple tool that uh, it's an international standard for um, translation management. So there's a file a format called XLIF. XLIF is a standard translations uh, file that she can just export the content into that file and then that file would be used by the translators to um, perform the translations through tools such as SDL or PO editor. These are softwares that uh, the editors would import and do the translations through the tool, export the, the, the file back and send it back to Jane. Jane would import it and then publish it on the website. The last option that could also be available is the CMS user. 
So if none of those options are available, like a machine translation or translation service or a file exchange, then um, she can also assign an existing user. Maybe um, Jane's company has an in-house translator who manages the translations and he just logs into the CMS and does the translation directly into the CMS. This is also available. It's a cool feature that allows users to be able to be assigned a skill because obviously you'd need a user that has the skill to translate from a language to the other, while a different user would find would have a different skill. I will show you that in a bit in a demo. Once the provider finishes the translation, Jane would receive the translation directly in her CMS, directly in Drupal, and then she would review the translations, make sure everything is in proper uh, situation and proper shape, and just publishes to the website. All right, so showing, uh, I want to show you a demo, and this demo is implementing Varbase, which is Vardot's own distribution CMS built on Drupal 9, plus the translation management workflow modules that make all this translation workflow available inside of the CMS itself. Right, so the, the first demo I want to show you is Jane created a new content, and that content is now uh, needs to be translated. So she needs to request a new translation after the new content has been created. So an example is a blog post that is titled Go Global with Drupal, a multilingual website. She'd click on the translate tab inside of the CMS. Through this screen, you'll notice that it gives you an overview of the current language for the CMS, the available languages for the content and the available languages uh, that are not translated. Jane wants to translate to Spanish, so she check that box and request translation. And now Jane is reviewing the translation. It would tell her the number of words available in this article. So if she's dealing with a paid service, she would know how much she, she'd be paying. It also suggests certain related content like categories or even users or authors of the article if you also want to translate those. And then she'd choose which provider would be doing that translation. So right now you're seeing that we're using Google as an example. There's also a Drupal user, which I, which I just mentioned that you can just assign to a person. So if I'm translating English to Spanish, we have Jose and Jose is the assigned translator for that skill. If she switches to Arabic, a different person will come up because Hassan is the one who is assigned the translation in the CMS between English and Arabic. For the paper purposes of this demo, we will just switch to Spanish. And lastly, the, the final provider is the file exchange. File exchange, as I mentioned, it's a robust way that just exports an XLIF file where you can import on a system. Right, so let's just try Google and submit to provider. Google is instant, it's really fast. And this video has not been sped up. So now the translation is available. She can click on review and she'd be presented with a side-by-side -side translation that shows the English content and the translated Spanish version of the content. So she can edit if, if she notices any of the um, uh, content that needs to be managed or edited. So she just reviews the content. This is the body of the article. Meta tags are also translated. Categories are also translated and tags are also translated. So, with that, she can just mark every translation as good and save for later. Or she can save as completed and publish instantly. But before we're going to save, she might want to edit one or three things for the Spanish. So we're just removing a space over here. And then we'll hit save as completed. Now the content has been translated it's completed and it has been accepted and published as a fully translated Spanish version of that article. So looking at that, there you go. We have the article automatically translated from Google as a service provider for the translation. So the next demo I wanna show you is, there's also the possibility to translate multiple items in one translation job. The screen we're currently looking at is the screen that shows the different 
content available in the website, whether they are resource or blog or news, case studies, and it would tell you if this content is available in all languages or not. So we're looking at some content is not available in Spanish. So Jane is checking these boxes. She wants to translate four content items into Spanish and then just choose the target language to Spanish and request the translation. And now the same way, the same review screen, um, you'll notice that the total number of words from all these four articles is now appearing here. And similarly, there are suggestions if we want to add to this translation job. Maybe she wants to assign to a user or a file exchange, but for now we're gonna stick to Google. So submitting to provider, instantly Google is really fast, it's amazing. So it just gives you all these four languages available and translated fully inside the CMS. If we go to job items, this is where the job items from um, the, the bulk job that we just did are available. And it shows here that all of these, they need review. So she can go one by one and just hit review. Similar screen would appear as the demo that we uh, saw a little bit uh, in a little bit. So you'll see here that she can do the same thing. This is an article that has been translated and just submit or save as completed so that the, this content is now available to be translated. Here's a summary of the job. So it shows that this content has been accepted. At the same time, she can go on and um, translate the rest of the content. The third demo and screen I wanna show you is the different function, functions and capabilities that you can do with this translation dashboard. So this translation dashboard is really amazing. It just hosts and brings up everything in the website from different content types, gives you in a holistic overview, the different available languages. You can filter by certain content types. So for instance, we wanna see only the news and the status of the news items that are already translated. You can also filter by um, not necessarily content. So there are several components and building blocks that make up the website. For instance, the taxonomy terms, which are categories mainly. So you'll see here that you can also translate tags, that are related to certain content and also the locale, which is the interface itself. So all these labels and strings that appear in your forms in, in the website, such as help, page title, footer menu, and all of these, you can also manage them through this single holistic interface that gives you the overview of all um, content in your site. And you'll notice here that there's different content statuses. So there's the home shows up as the original language, non-translated, translated. And if there's an outdated translation can also appear from here. All right. So I'd, I would like to highlight additional benefits of using the translation management workflow in your CMS. The, the benefit that I just showed you gives you a holistic overview of the site's content translations. And I'm gonna talk about this in um, a minute. The flagging of content, when a content has been already edited, you can flag content or translations to be outdated. And also there's a capability where you can just set up automated continuous translation jobs, where if a new content has been created or edited, you can just the system would automatically detect that and send it to the translation provider. So the overview of translation is a really cool feature. We, we just saw it in the demo and I wanna um, highlight a couple of important features here. You'll see that there are different icons that give you the different statuses of um, this content. So the original language, the content has been originally created. It shows up as the home icon. While if it's not translated, it shows up as an X. If the translation has been flagged as outdated, it shows up at this icon, as this icon. There's a needs review if Jane wants to review before she publishes. And also if content or um, if content is being still translated, this, is, this will typically happen if you're using a manual service like an, um, a Drupal user 
that would be performing the edits or translations, or if you're using a third party real translators, so they're not a machine translation, it would also show as it's currently in progress, it's being translated. And once it, it's submitted back to Jane in the CMS, it would show up as needs review. The second benefit is flagging content already translated as outdated. So while Jane is editing one of those pages, let's assume that this page, the home page, has already been translated. And after it has been translated, Jane wants to edit the English version of this content. So she can simply check the box to flag other translations as outdated, and it would show up on the dashboard for the translation as that content is now translated where she can then create a new job for the provider, the translation provider, to translate that content. The last cool feature is setting up an automated continuous translation job. Through the same tool, the same translation management workflow, when you create, you can create an, a continuous job. The continuous job allows you to automatically and continuously submit all new content or even updated content to whatever translator that you have already configured. So for instance, if we've just edited the, um, the homepage, it would just detect that the homepage has been edited. It would send it to Google to translate it again, and then um, we can review it to publish it. So with that in mind, with the, with, with the, with the understanding that the system can allow us to streamline the continuous um, tr translation of content, we can, we, what we will need to do right now is how to announce localized content to search engines. We will get a little bit technical here. So um, I, I, I wanna highlight that we're not only talking about Google, we're talking about different search engines like Bing or Baidu. If you're targeting Chinese, you definitely need Baidu to understand your website. So if your website is available on different languages, the important thing is that we need to tell those search engines about the different languages. And the reason is that we need them to serve the right version of content, the right language to, their, to the audience. So if we look at an example here, if we Google Apple official website, from Google inside of the US, the first result would appear www.apple.com, which is the US version. While if we Google the same keyword from inside of Spain, Google would show us apple.com slash ES, which is the Spanish version of Apple. And the way we do that is through something called hreflang. So hreflang is an HTML attribute that we use in websites to specify the language and geographical target of a web page. If you have multiple versions of, of pages, you need to tell Google that this page is available on all of those um, different variations. So imagine that your site has an, a US version. It also has an, um, a Spanish version. The way we do that is hreflang meta tag would link, the US version would link to the Spanish version and the Spanish version would link to the US version and also they would link to each other. So each page would link to itself so that Google understands that this page is available on different um, uh, multilingual or different languages. It looks like that. So in the HTML code, you'd see that this is uh, the example of IBM. IBM really has translated their website into a lot of languages and also localized it into uh, certain into a lot of countries. So you'd see here that we have fr-dz, so the French language, and uh, it's targeted to the country code dz. Also, you have enag, enaw, enau. All of that means that this page that, are, that I'm currently looking at is available in all these different languages. You can also use the hreflang implementation in XML sitemaps. And typically, Google and search engines, they would understand hreflang implementation, whether by the HTML head meta tags or through the XML sitemap. The good news is that while it is technical, it's you really don't need to do that yourself. So the CMS should be capable to do that for you. And this is an example again of the homepage that we're currently building. 
in the CMS. So you'll see here in the on the right side, there's the meta tags, and all of these are automatically generated. So if we have an English international, it's just going to automatically generate that page into the English international variation, similarly to the U United States variation, Great Britain variation, and Spanish variation. So the CMS should be able to take care of that for you and announce the different variations of content to search engines. With that, I want to close uh, with a final remark. I, um, um, and after that, we are open for questions. Uh, the final remark that I want to mention is that utilizing a CMS such as Varbase, which is a Drupal 9 CMS, um, the most recent version of Varbase is currently built on Drupal 9, and it implements all of these multilingual capabilities. Utilizing a CMS like that would make Jane's life, your editors, your website editors' life easier. It would make the, the creation of translated content and the management of translated content very easy, and it would ensure also the search engine visibility for all of your um, different content variations, whether they are targeted for a regional uh, variation or through a, a fully translated or a different language. I want to mention here that, um, again, this um, all of these capabilities are available in the most recent version of Barbase. So if you've already have a website that has been built on Drupal or on Varbase, uh, but it's not up to date to the most recent version, which is built on Drupal 9, you might not see all of those features available. Some of them are currently available, but not all of them. So feel free to reach out to us um, if you would like to um, discuss having those features available for you where you can implement your multilingual um, journey. And with that, I think um, uh, we are open to questions. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for this uh, informative session. Uh, as you said, let's jump into the Q&A. So please uh, start submitting your questions. Okay, let's start with what we received so far. Uh, first we have, uh, is Varbase open source and how is it different from Drupal? All right. So yes, Varbase is open source and it is available uh, for anyone to download, install, configure your site. Um, it, it, is, um, it does require some technical knowledge. So it does require understanding of the Drupal uh, building blocks and the coding language of, of obviously PHP and Drupal. So um, you can install it from drupal.org slash uh, project slash Varbase. Um, it, it, the way it is different from uh, Drupal is that it is a distribution. So a distribution, I'll, I'll just give an example. Um, um, the most common example is Android. So Android is an operating system for mobile devices. However, if you buy a Samsung phone or an LG phone, you will not use Android as is, but you, what you'll use is a distribution of Android that is tailored for Samsung's own opinionated features of what Android should look like. So this is what we've done. We've taken Drupal, we have tailored it, added certain modules to it, certain enhancements, such as the multilingual features that you've seen in this webinar. And um, with that, we just packaged it with our opinionated understanding of how a CMS built on Drupal should be. So think of it as Drupal plus uh, some um, enhancements. Okay, thank you, Mohammed. Um, next we have, do you store and manage these translations on the front end website or do you store it in the database? All right. Yeah, so this is a technical question and happy to answer it. The All the translations provided from Drupal CMS are being stored in the database. So they are not uh, stored in, in the front end. Um, and they are stored in the database and you can, of course, export them so that you can reuse them through um, a file extension, which is called PO. So .PO is a file extension that Drupal can export to if you wanna reuse those translations and export them from the database into files. 
Okay. Next we have, is this multilingual feature, uh, does, it, does this multilingual feature come by default with Drupal or, or is it uh, in the form of an add-on? All right. So yeah, this multilingual feature, some of those multilingual feature come uh, by default with Drupal. So as I mentioned, the var-based distribution is open source. It adds those features and adds those multilingual capabilities and other capabilities to Drupal. So there are some features that are available on Drupal, but a lot of features have been built on top of Drupal through the var-based distribution. Uh, next, we have a question about if it would be easy. Um, it, it, it's a question regarding uh, accepting sales in different countries. Uh, is, is that easy to add or incorporate also? All right. Yeah, regarding, well, uh, definitely. So with regard to accepting sales in different countries, is that easy to add or incorporate as well? I think it um, it does. Yeah, it is easy if you're using the most recent version of uh, Drupal 9 and Varbase. So we can, um, in regards to sales, if your website has a commerce functionality, then we would also be implementing on Drupal there, uh, a suite of modules called Drupal Commerce. If you already have your site implemented on Drupal, you are most likely using already using that suite of modules, which is Drupal Commerce. The, the good thing is Drupal Commerce is multilingual ready. So it actually plugs in to those multilingual features where you can have products available for each different region or country where you can accept sales um, and also configure different currencies to, um, um, for people, for instance, purchasing your product from Europe, they would pay by Euro. If they would be um, from the US, they would be paying uh, by US dollar. However, these um, features, when it comes to the different currencies available, for instance, there are they are actually managed by Drupal Commerce. So it gets a little bit technical, but maybe the short answer and the brief answer here is that everything plugs together into Drupal and everything actually works together. So with these multilingual features that I just showed you here, um, if you have Drupal Commerce, they go hand in hand. And yes, you can implement um, sales in different countries and tailor or configure the, um, the currencies and sales for different countries. When it comes to is it easy or not, it does require uh, development on Drupal. So it's definitely something that can be implemented, but um, it does require an expert Drupal developer or professional who can build that for you. Next, we have an interesting question about if we can uh, have a more complex translation uh, workflow. Um, yeah, so this is a good question. If we can have more complex translation workflows, the, trans the current translation workflow is really um, just implements the workflow of sending the translation to an external provider or a Drupal user or a file where you can do the translations then on a different system. And this is where the complexity can be added. Or if you have a more integrated and complex translation workflow, you will most likely implement that through the provider rather than inside the CMS itself. We want to focus here that the CMS is a tool that should be robust, resilient, at the same time, easy to use. So Jane would not... Um, or a website editor would not face a lot of trouble or complexity in managing the different kind of content. So I don't think that a more complex workflow can be implemented on the current version of the translation management and Drupal. But if you do have a complex translation workflow, you can definitely implement that or delegate that to the provider. Okay, next we have um, a question. I'm using Varbase and group module to build uh, multiple regional radio website. Some of them are multilingual uh, with local languages, uh, some are not. Is this a good practice or should I use multi-site instead of uh, group? That is an interesting question. 
So I always say that there are you know, 100 ways where you can implement a feature or a capability in Drupal, but there's probably one or two ways only that should be the best practices. And I think it really depends on the use case and the business case that you're trying to implement. There are pros and cons for every feature or every capability or module that you implement in, in your site. So if you want to consider multiple regional radio websites, I think the question would be, is the, um, uh, the groups module the best implementation or is it the domain access, which, is, which gives you also the multi-site implementation in Drupal, or even is it the multi-site capability inside of Drupal? So it really depends and there are pros and cons for each approach. It's gonna be very hard for me to answer if this is a good practice to use the group or the multi-site without knowing the exact details of your use case, your audiences, your editor's experience, and um, your must-haves versus your ni nice-to-haves features in your website. Um, they can work together. So a group module with multilingual capabilities can work together. But um, yeah, I think it's very hard for me to be able to answer such a question without knowing the uh, more details about your, your um, uh, business model and uh, business requirements. Okay, I think we have a new one now. Uh, how can we activate this type of translator in, uh, in our CMS and can our website uh, take benefit of this new feature and the website's language is in uh, Surani all right yeah um, so this is an um, you know it, it's a two parts question I'm gonna answer the first part first um, if if how how can you activate this type of translation system in your CMS it's um, it is available in the most recent version of Barbase and Drupal 9. It is something that um, requires a little bit of configuration and implementation. So um, reach out to us and we are happy to explore this option, configure it for your own translation workflow and implement it for you. So we can do that for you. Just reach out and um, we will be uh, happy to service you. The second part of the question is that if the website is available in two languages, so Sorani and Kormanji, um, so how can they take benefit of that new feature? Similar, similarly, once we implement that feature, it's, as I mentioned in the beginning, that all these multilingual capabilities are implemented in a, sim, in a single CMS. So this one CMS holds and manages all of these different languages. So if your website is already built to have multiple languages, in that case would be Sorani and Kormanji, then the language translation interface would integrate with those languages and allow you to manage different translations to that uh, for that languages. I don't think that Google, for instance, could translate uh, between Sorani and Kormanji. They probably do translate to certain languages. I think Sorani and Kormanji, um, they are a Kurdish languages. So if you want to translate from English to Sorani, I think that feature would be available. But to translate between Sorani and Kormanji, implementing machine translation such as Google might not be the best for, um, option for you. I don't think they do offer uh, such a translation service. Because of that, you can utilize either XLF files where you can just download and upload, or you can just assign it to a Drupal CMS user. If you have the institutional capacity, you have someone on board who logs into the CMS and translates content between Sorani and Kormanji, you can definitely use this feature um, to manage those translations. I hope I have answered all your questions. I think that's it for today. Let's give it a minute or two if uh, anybody would like to ask any, any uh, other questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, I want to recap again with uh, all these cool new features that are available in Drupal 9. And we do believe that these are best in breed multilingual capabilities 
and functionalities that allow you to easily manage uh, multilingual websites. And with that, I think we don't have any further questions. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, over to you, Rashid, for uh, our closing remarks. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, for this great content. And uh, of course, thank you all for watching. Uh, please, if you have any questions or feedback, please visit our website where you will find the Contact Us page and we'll put you in touch with the best member of our team. Uh, if you would like to see us do a specific webinar topic next, please send it over also on the Contact Us form. A quick reminder that this webinar will be sent to you via email in the next few days, in addition to being uploaded on varda.com. Thank you again for your questions and attendance. Have a great week. Goodbye.